Hey guys, we're going to be looking at 7.5 Video Lecture Notes Part 2 today. Uh, we've already done Part 1 when we discussed the Cold War. Now we're going to get into uh, some events of the Cold War. Uh, of course, all of this is going to start with our learning objective questions. Uh, you might want to jot these down um, so you can make sure that you answer them at the end. So this is what you should get out of this lesson after you've um, gone through the uh, notes and you should be able to answer these questions. How was Berlin divided after World War II? Explain the Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift. Uh, what was the purpose of the Berlin Wall? Explain the importance of Reagan's tear down this wall speech. Uh, how does containment fail for the United States? And explain the development of the Korean War and the outcome. Let's start with the city of Berlin. Um, after World War II, of course, Berlin is going to be divided into um, really into four zones. So you're going to have a British section, which you see here, um, a French section, which you see here, a U.S. section, and a Soviet Union section. So this, the um, Berlin's going to be divided as well as the entire country of Germany, and it's going to be divided in this way. So uh, make sure you know that it was divided into these different zones. Eventually, the western portion of, of Germany is going to become West Germany. The eastern portion of Germany is going to become East Germany. East Germany is going to become communist. West Germany is going to become free and democratic. Um, the capital, which is the city of Berlin, would also be divided into these different zones. And... Um, this is going to create a lot of problems because we already know the tension between the U.S. and the Soviet Union after World War II is over with. And this tension is going to really emerge and show itself during um, this period after the war in Germany and in Berlin. Uh, we're going to get some, an event known as the Berlin Blockade. And what the Soviets were going to try to do is they were going to try to surround the city of Berlin. Remember, Berlin had been divided into... Uh, into zones as well, which you see down here at the bottom. Um, so they're going to surround the entire city and try to keep West Berlin from getting supplies and food. And um, the United States is going to have to respond. What the Soviets are hoping for is that the U.S. and Great Britain and France are going to basically just give up on West Berlin and Berlin would become part of their zone as well. But the United States is not going to let that go. That's when we get what we call uh, the Berlin Airlift. The USSR has surrounded the entire city with the Berlin blockade to keep the uh, citizens of West Berlin from getting food. But the United States is going to respond by sending in planes to drop food and supplies to the citizens of West Berlin. Uh, you can see this was a major undertaking just simply by looking at this map. Uh, these planes are going to go 24 hours a day uh, back and forth from uh, West, uh, West Germany uh, to the city of West Berlin. And you can see how these planes were going. Finally, the Russians are going to give up on the idea of the blockade. Um, the Berlin airlift is a success uh, and West Berlin remained free and democratic while East Berlin stayed under the control of the communist nation of East Germany. Uh, who is also a puppet country or a satellite country of the Soviet Union. Again, here's some pictures of the Berlin Wall. Um, and the Berlin Wall would eventually be set up all because of this, uh, these tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And um, this sort of becomes the symbol of the Cold War tensions. So it's sort of like a focal point of everything that's involved in the Cold War. And you can see here's the Berlin Wall. Uh, here's a picture or a political cartoon showing the Russian bear with his arms completely around the city of Berlin, you know, trying to show how the Berlin blockade was going to keep the U.S. and the British and the French from being able to deliver supplies. And then, of course, here's a picture of the wall during the 1980s and uh, finally the fall of the wall, which we're going to talk about. Uh, in the next uh, couple of um, minutes. So what we get in the 1980s, and I know we're skipping around a little bit, but you need to know this. Um, the Berlin Wall is constructed um, during 
the 19, early 1960s. It was built under Nikita Khrushchev. Um, it was meant to keep the East Germans from defecting to West Berlin. And um, this is when we get this famous speech uh, later on in the 1980s. Now, the wall was erected in the 1960s. Uh, the 1980s, a new president, Ronald Reagan, comes into play. Um, he's going to be president from 1980 to 1988. And he is actually going to go to the wall, and he's going to issue this famous statement where he says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Gorbachev, of course, is the Russian leader during this period. Here's a picture of him over here. You can see him has a, the, you know, sort of symbolic birthmark on his head. That's what he was always remembered for, um, as well as, you know, the fall of communism. But Reagan's going to go and he's going to go to the Brandenburg Gate, which is right in the middle of the Berlin Wall. And he's going to make this famous speech, tear down this wall. And um, this is symbolic for a lot of reasons. It's just amazing that we asked for this during this period. Um, but the Russians and the Soviet Union during this period, um, they're starting to crumble at this point. Reagan is sort of pushing the edge by going ahead and, and saying, look, if you want to put an end to all this tension, put an end to um, uh all of these things that have this hatred and things that have been building up for so long, then you want to do something symbolic, tear this wall down. And that's what that speech was all about. And the wall is symbolic because it really sort of marks the beginning of the end uh, for the Cold War, as well as uh, beginning of the end uh, to the fall of communism. So, um, this speech is famous for that. Uh, it sort of marks that 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 turning point where communism, uh, the Cold War, are sort of coming to an end. And eventually this wall does come down. Uh, by the early 1990s, the Berlin Wall has been taken down. And we'll just go back to this picture here, and you can see them tearing down the wall uh, during uh, the early 1990s. And this is what it looked like before. The wall had been torn down, and you can see soldiers and things on the other side. But again, the tear down this wall speech, symbolic for those reasons. Containment was the policy that was issued uh, by Harry S. Truman uh, after World War II. We have to try to contain communism, but containment begins to fail. Um, the first country that sort of shows containment is failing, is, and this is going to mainly be in Asia, is going to be China. China becomes a communist nation in 1949, led by this guy that you see over here on the right, Mao Zedong. Mao is M-A-O-Z-E-D-O-N-G. Um, he is going to lead the communists in uh, China for their eventual takeover of China. And this marks sort of the idea that containment's not working. The other problem that we had was we were really worried about Asia because once China falls, now we're worried that all these other countries that you see over here in this picture are also going to fall to communism. Um, this is known as the domino theory, and these uh, Asian countries are listed as dominoes here, and that if one country falls, then that means all of the other countries are going to fall right along with them. And then, of course, we've got this picture here showing how communism or the Soviet Union is trying to take over, uh, you know, everything in Europe and Asia and Africa and so on. The communism is going to spread. So the containment is failing at this point. It's not working. And, of course, things aren't looking good uh, as far as uh, for the United States, as far as stopping communism. One flashpoint occurs shortly after World War II, and that's going to be the Korean War. Um, Korea during World War II had been a Japanese uh, colony, um, but after the war, it's going to be split between the United States and the Soviet Union. The northern section under the control of the Soviet Union, while the southern section would be under the control of the United States. Uh, eventually, those two places, north and south, are going to be turned back over to the people of Korea, but the northern portion becomes a communist nation and the southern portion becomes a free and democratic nation, much like east and west um, Germany. 
Uh, China is going to back North Korea, and by this time we know that China is a communist country. Um, they're going to back North Korea, and with this backing, the North Koreans are going to decide that they want South Korea. And so their armies are going to move into South Korea. And once that takes place, the United Nations is going to try to uh, step in. And the U.S. is going to be the main uh, supplier of armies for this United Nations force that's going to be sent to Korea to try to stop the North Koreans from taking South Korea. The U.N. referred to this as a police action. And, um, of course, most of the troops involved in the fighting in Korea were troops from the United States. Uh, the communist leader of North Korea was a guy named Kim, Il Kim Il-sun. Of course, he is the great, I think he's the great-grandfather of Kim Jong-un uh, today, who's the leader of North Korea. So, um, but he's going to lead uh, the communists in North Korea, Kim Il-sung would. If you don't know how to spell his name, it's, uh, of course, Kim, K-I-M, Il, I-L, and then last name Sung, S-U-N-G. So Kim Il-sung would be the leader of the communists in North Korea. This fighting would continue for three years, eventually leading to a stalemate, neither side gaining an advantage. Uh, for a period of time, the United States uh, and the UN forces did push the North Koreans back towards China. Um, only to have the North Koreans sort of resupply and then push the uh, UN forces and the U.S. back into South Korea. Um, and so a line is going to be drawn across the Korean Peninsula. That line is going to be the 38th parallel. It would divide the Koreas up between North and South, the North being communist, South being free and democratic. Uh, this line, the 38th parallel, will be known as a demilitarized zone, meaning no armies could occupy that one area. And so borders and fences and all sorts of things were set up by the North Koreans there. Uh, and no treaty was ever signed to officially end this war. The war takes place, though, between 1950 and 1953. Okay, that's going to do it for um, this part two of 7.5. Let's look at your learning objective questions. Again, make sure you write these questions down. You answer them on your note sheet. Have them ready to go. Uh, bring these questions and the um, notes to me so I can check you off. Start reviewing. Uh, we'll probably be having a quiz on 7.5 coming up real soon. So um, make sure you have part one, part two, and unfortunately there's going to be a part three because 7.5 is pretty long, so a lot of information in 7.5. Make sure you got your notes. If you got any questions, feel free to ask me once you're done with the uh, video lecture. Okay, catch you guys on the next one.